Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. How do you know that something's important? Really, how do you know? How do you know that something is significant? Now, before you start going in your mind and answering that question, yes or no, or describing the process to determine importance, let me share a few stories with you that might affect the way you answer that question. How do you know something is important? So there was once a German monk, but he wasn't born a monk, of course. He was born a little boy in Eiselden, Germany, to a pretty normal family, kind of middle, middle of the road family, with a dad who had high expectations for him. He wanted him to become a lawyer. And so that's what he started going to school for. But God had other plans for this little boy from Eiselden, Germany. He was on his way home from school one time, and there was a great storm. And he hid under a tree, and he made a vow to God that if he spared him in the midst of this terrible storm, that he would dedicate his life to the service of God. If you don't already know who this is, it's Martin Luther. But I often wonder, I, said, I thought to myself when I was reading the text for this Sunday... What would it have been like to be the pastor or the priest at the church that Martin Luther went to as a boy? Would I have known what God was going to use him for? Certainly not. And yet, God's plan for this little boy who eventually becomes an Augustinian monk And then the great reformer we know when we look back in history of the Reformation, God knew. God had his plans. Or maybe you're familiar with the story of Gideon in the Bible, in Judges. And the story of Gideon is interesting because God does what God usually does. Right, Paul tells us that he chooses the weak and insignificant to shame the wise and powerful. And he shows up to Gideon, and Gideon is working at their family's home. And, and God basically says, hey, Gideon, I want you to free my people from this much more powerful en- enemy in Midian. And what is Gideon's response? He's like, are you in the right place? I mean, my clan is the weakest In Manasseh, and in my own family, I have the least standing. Maybe a little more of a modern story. So I'm not sure I'm saying the husband's names right. Adoniram and Anne Judson. You probably haven't heard their names, but they were the first American missionaries to the country of Burma. And they started many churches there, and the husband, over the time that he stayed there, wrote the Bible in their native language. You never know when you look around the way the Lord is going to use the individuals in our midst. How do you know something's important? How do you know something is significant? We can go on and on with stories of this. You probably know a few yourself. Perhaps you've experienced this phenomenon in your own life. Maybe someone said something at a lecture you were at or you had a conversation with somebody and a certain phrase just shocked you and totally reoriented something about your life. And then you talk about it with them maybe a few years later and they don't even remember the conversation. They had no idea that this thing that they said was so significant to you. What often starts out small and insignificant by our eyes God ends up using for something far grander than we or the people involved could ever have imagined. That's what our text today is about. That's what our gospel text is about. That's what Paul's talking about when he says that we're a people that walk by faith and not by sight. We can't trust our own senses when it comes to things of God. We're limited. Our vision is limited. Our understanding is limited. But thanks be to God that our God is not. 
But it's not all mystery. There are some great gospel promises in our text today that should bring us comfort. In the first section of our gospel, verses 26 to 29, we hear of a man who is sowing the seed day and night. And it specifically says that he goes to bed and wakes up and the seed has sprouted and he knows not how. He's not the one doing the growing. He doesn't know how the growing happens. All he knows is that what he is supposed to do is scatter the seed. And of course we know in this parable that the seed is the word of God. And through that word comes the life that we have in Christ. That's how life was sprung up in you. That's how life took root in your heart, was by hearing God's word. And maybe you actually remember the person who told you that. The first time you heard that God loves you and he proved his love for you by sending Jesus to take your sins upon himself. And he died, paid that penalty, and rose victorious from the grave. And now because of that, you have life. Life right now and life to come forevermore. That seed is sown, but we know not how the growth happens. And we regularly get ourselves into trouble, and there are plenty of examples of this in the scriptures, and I'm sure in your own life, when we try to take that process over. When we attempt to try and know and understand how that growth is going to occur. Because then what do we end up doing? We end up coming up with our plan. And the things that we see that are significant. And I ask again, how do you know what's significant? How do you know what's important in God's mission? So what do we do then? If we don't know how it works, if we don't know how faith comes about and how it grows, what are we to do? Well, the short answer is scatter the seed. Right? We're called to share God's word as we're given opportunity with those that he places in our life. But the deeper answer is we're called to obey and have faith in God. We're obeying God's calling in our life. Right, Each one of us has a slightly different calling. I'm a pastor. You might be a lawyer. You might be a doctor, a teacher. You might be a mom or a dad, a husband and wife. All of those things come with a calling from God, and we are to obey that calling. And along with our obedience comes a trust, a faith, that he is in charge and knows what he's doing. Maybe I don't understand why it's so important that in this particular calling I have to do this thing. Or maybe I don't want to do this thing. But I do it nonetheless because I trust in God. I obey his calling in my life because I know that he is not limited in the ways that I am. And that he's the one who determines the things of importance. So maybe he's calling you to do something here in this community. He maybe is calling you or your kids to be missionaries in Burma or Japan, or somewhere else on the other side of the globe. Who knows? You don't, nor do they. I had no idea, even this time last year, that I'd be in Pittsburgh. Right? But God did. And so we entrust that to his care. The second parable in our gospel reading is the mustard seed. Everybody knows the mustard seed parable, right? And and Sherry had a nice picture at the very beginning on the welcome slide of a mustard seed in someone's hand. You can see how tiny it is. So the first one was about the mystery. We don't really know how it works, but we know what we are to do is to obey God's calling and trust in his plan and his provision for salvation He did a pretty good job with Jesus, right? So he probably knows what he's doing. 
much more than we do. And we don't always know how that works or when. But in the second one, the mustard seed, I ask you again that same question. How do you know what's important? How do you know what is significant? The answer is we don't. You don't. I don't. And even the people who God is going to use to go on to do incredible things, they have no idea either. Usually we don't find out that God's doing something cool or incredible through us until we're right in the middle of it. And somebody else sometimes even has to point it out to us. But that's the way it's meant to be, lest we think it's about us, because it's really not. It's about God and his plan and his working in the world. You see, we don't know what's important, but we do know something. We know what is good. God has revealed to us what is good and what we ought to do. We aren't meant to get into the business of determining what is important because that question is beyond our limitations. Just try and parse that out for a moment. Think of all of the different possibilities. Someone in here sitting right now could be the next great evangelist to revive the whole continent of Europe. Who knows? I don't. You don't. But God does. And so we don't walk by our own sight, but we walk by faith in the one who can see all things. Look at the story of Gideon, or really take any number of stories from the scriptures. God chose the weakest person from the weakest clan by worldly vision and sight, the most insignificant person to free his people from a great worldly power. And even though Gideon is the weakest in his family, do you know any of the names of his family? We know Gideon. And we know Gideon not because he was great, but because God worked great things through him. This is how God works. It's how he works in your life. It's how he works in mine. It's how he works in the church. As he takes the small and insignificant the people that we would never choose, the ways that we would never decide to go about things. And that's how God does it. Take something small and seemingly foolish and shakes the foundations of the world. And of course, all those stories in the scriptures that exemplify that tendency of God are found most in the story of Jesus. Think about the grand and magnificent plan of salvation that was executed through Jesus Christ. Nothing but the salvation of those who have made themselves enemies of God, hopelessly unable to turn that around, not even looking for a Savior, and yet one is sent, and he accomplishes all of that perfectly. Now just think about that if God laid out that problem at your foot. He says, hey, here's the deal. Creation is kind of in the trash. Right? Everybody that I made and love hates me and works against me. They don't even acknowledge my existence half the time. And here's what I need to happen. I need to fix that. I need to redeem those people. How would you go about doing that? Well, if we're going by our worldly vision, our own way of doing things, we'd think, oh, well, you need to find the smartest person who's already in a position of influence, who can affect the world around them, so that they can do what you want them to do in the world so that you get the desired result. But instead what he does is he doesn't show up with a bunch of lights and loud sounds and roaring thunder and in the majesty of his divinity, but he's born a little baby to a human woman in the trough of a stable from a city of Nazareth, which even by the people who lived around it was a place of no account. What good can come from Nazareth after all? Well, now we know. But can you imagine being Jesus' neighbor in Nazareth? You have no idea who he is, that you're literally living 80 feet from the Son of God, the King of the universe. So how do you know what's important? 
You don't. I don't. But God does. And think about even within the church how easy it is for us to start wanting to do things our own way. How tempting it is to start to say, you know what, here's what I think is important and here's what I think we should do. Whether it's individually, whether it's jointly as a congregation, and pretty soon we're no longer praying for wisdom and guidance from God. We're no longer open to his guiding and direction, but we have our plan in mind. I don't know how many chess players are out there, but if you get that way in the game of chess, you lose. If you're focused on your plan and you don't notice anything else, you don't win. Your king gets taken. Fortunately for us, God works through us despite our tendency to do these things, despite our imperfections, our selfishness, our know-it-all attitude about things that we really cannot grasp. And that in lies the comfort of our gospel reading today. You probably, after hearing those words, felt a sense of peace. I know I did. I walk by faith and not by sight. And notice that despite the mystery of these parables, what is the guaranteed end result? It didn't say, well, maybe the seed will grow. It says the seed grew. And it grew up and bore fruit. It doesn't say that maybe the mustard seed will turn into this big plant. It says it does turn into this big plant. The point being that if this plan and this this plan of salvation that God has was left to our devices, we're in trouble. But thanks be to God that it is not left up to us. It would be a despairing reality to come to terms with the idea that we can't know what's really important in God's plan of salvation if it left us only there. But God tells us, you don't need to know. I'm at work in the world. I'm providing for this plan. I'm raising up people through the institution of my church and the power of the casting of my word, that seed taking root in people, bearing new life. It wasn't Luther's childhood pastor that was responsible for his influence and what he ended up doing in the Reformation. It was God. His childhood pastor was simply called to do the thing that he was supposed to do. Obey God. Preach the word faithfully. Go about the things that God has placed in front of him to do. And so are we. That's what we are called to do. And maybe for you, God leads you into some grand adventure where he's going to work mightily through you. Maybe it's raising your children in the faith. Maybe it's reaching out to your neighbors in your community and starting some sort of initiative. Who knows? I don't. You don't. But God does. Now, I want to be clear here. This isn't an argument for inaction. We don't say, oh, well, God's got it. No problem. That's not what we're saying here. It's quite the opposite, in fact. What we're saying is that you have been saved by grace, not by your own works, called according to his purposes, and made children of God. That's done. Jesus has accomplished that in you. But now he's got something he wants you to do. He wants you to scatter that seed And he's got a place for you to go with it. He knows. I don't know. You don't know, but he does. And he'll reveal that to you in due time. But we can have hope and confidence in God's plan of salvation because regardless of what part I might play or you might play, the end result is guaranteed. A massive tree from a tiny seed. Life springing forth from good soil. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we do our given part, obeying our Lord's commands and doing our best, just like Luther and Gideon and Adoniram and Anne, 
We do our best to do what God calls us to do, to obey his will, to be about the work of God in spreading his word as he gives us opportunity in the hope and confidence in knowing that it's beyond my understanding, therefore beyond my control, but it is in control by the one who can see all of those things and do all of those things, our all-powerful and unlimited God. By the way, this is such a huge comfort to me as a pastor when I get up here and preach God's word to you. I do my diligence, I do my research, I read the scriptures, I prepare and practice. But if it was all up to me up here to get across the truth of God's word, sorry to say, you guys are in a lot of trouble. Thankfully, I know that I'm not the one responsible for the growth of the Word of God that is being planted in you, but it is by the Holy Spirit. And so I'll close with this thought. It reminds me of the passage from Isaiah 55. God's Word is sent out by Him through you. And when He sends it out, He sends it out for a purpose And that purpose, Isaiah tells us, will be accomplished. It may not happen exactly the way we expect or at the timing that we would like, but it will be accomplished according to what God wills it. So you may have heard me use an example of there's sometimes people come up to me after service and say, Pastor, I really enjoyed your sermon. I loved it, especially when you said this. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't think I said that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, taking what is being heard from God's Word and applying it to you. I can't know your heart, but He does. Grow into something far more amazing than we can imagine. That's what happens. So, our job is simple. We don't determine what's important or significant. We rely on God. We trust in Him. We pray to Him for guidance and and discernment. And we obey His command in our life. And through that, we know that He will work all things to good. That He will take this tiny seed, something we can't even recognize, and turn it into an amazing tree. Just in the same way He did with a little baby born in a stable trough from an insignificant town who died a criminal's death. But through that, he worked the salvation of the whole world. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again to make all things new. Amen.